All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending the kickoff webinar for the spring 2021 Michael M. Davis Lecture Series. The Center for Health Administration Studies continues to champion health research and services poly policy advocacy. In a moment, Chaz co-director and Crown Family School professor Harold Pollack will offer brief opening remarks and an introduction of today's author, Jonathan Cohen, senior national correspondent at HuffPost and his new book, the 10-Year War, Obamacare and the Unfinished Crusade for Universal Coverage. If you have any questions, please type them into the Zoom Q&A pane or into the chat. We will do our best to answer all questions uh, towards the end of the webinar. A recording of this webinar will be available on the CHAZ website, which is chaz.uchicago.edu, as well as via our CHAZ YouTube channel, which can be found searching for Center for Health Administration Studies. Take it away, Harold. Well, I'll be brief in the introduction because Jonathan assures me that none of his relatives are on the uh, are on requiring the full CV. Uh, as, as Keith mentioned, Jonathan is a senior national correspondent at HuffPost, and this and his book, The Ten Year War, I think is actually the best history of the Affordable Care Act and the related uh, trench warfare that that has been going on for a more than a decade now. It seems like only yesterday, actually, Jonathan and I were in the White House together in the back of the uh, East Room, I guess, watching uh, President Obama sign the ACA. And uh, unfortunately, I was not in photo into photography then, so I only have bad iPhone pictures of that event. But, uh, 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 but this is just, for those of you that haven't, that haven't seen the 10-year war, it's just a remarkable history that shows American politics and its strengths and weaknesses. I did wanna also, mentioned Jonathan to welcome today. We have some folks here that you know who are in the audience, Tim Jost, uh, Sarah Gawist, uh, uh, and uh, Leighton Koo, and Larry Levitt, and uh, uh, Erica Franklin Fowler, and Emma Sando, uh, and some other friends that, uh, that you may know who, uh, who, are, who are like the rest of us, so very anxious to hear what you have to say. And with that, I'll just uh, be quiet and uh, say I'm really looking forward to your presentation. I should uh, say, by the way, I will monitor the chat and the Q&A. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And, and I think we'll let Jonathan give his talk, but, but we'll keep, but then, the, then I'll moderate the question. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and completely petrifying me with that list of people who are attending because it's basically the list of people who I call to get answers when I have questions. So, you know, I, I, I guess appropriately so for the setting, I feel a bit like I'm in front of my dissertation committee uh, defending. Um, but I, I am really honored to be here. I'm especially, um, Harold, honored to be here with you. Um, we were together there on in the White House when Obama signed the Affordable Care Act. And, and that wasn't just an accident. Um, we had worked together. I've known you forever. Um, you are on that list of people who, who you actually know everything. And, and those of you out there, uh, Harold is, is not just one of the most knowledgeable people I know, but also one of the most generous and, um, and, and, and can speak to all of these issues professionally, personally, and just a, a, a real mensch. Um, so I, I'm very excited to be here. I will warn everyone in the audience, um, through random circumstance, we are having some work done on our roof today. Um, I, the, the, the people working on the roof have assured me they are going to uh, withhold from any saw work or other very loud noises for the next hour, but I, there may be some miscellaneous hammering and things. I like to think metaphorically, maybe that's appropriate because I'm going to talk about the Affordable Care Act, which is very much a work in progress, um, a home that at time uh, has certainly needed <laughs> renovation and serious repair work having undergone various forms of damage. Um, but here we are, and, and actually the timing I think is, 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 is to, to talk about the Affordable Care Act, um, it, it seems very appropriate for two reasons. First, we are in this pandemic, hopefully soon coming, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in the pandemic. But I feel like COVID-19 has really held up a mirror to our healthcare system and to the Affordable Care Act. And certainly you can see instances, anecdotal bits and pieces of how it has helped. And you can think about where we would be without the Affordable Care Act. Um, just yesterday here in the state of Michigan, the state reported that enrollment in the uh, Healthy Michigan Plan, which is our version of the Medicaid expansion, was up 
over 900,000, which is substantially higher than it had been before the pandemic when it was around 650,000. And we're seeing that all over the country. The best data we have suggests there has not been an enormous spike in the number of people without health insurance, which given the economic conditions of the country is quite remarkable. And I think a testimony to the Affordable Care Act doing what it's supposed to do. Um, having said that, we still have millions of Americans without health insurance. We have people with health insurance who have deductibles they cannot afford. And of course, there's all this confusion. You know, people are constantly not sure what bills they owe to whom, who is in their network. Um, I think sometimes the uh, experts uh, who work on healthcare policy, present company accepted, sometimes don't grasp the fact that that confusion is actually not just an annoyance, but it's a real problem for people. People end up not getting the health care they need. They end up owing very large bills because of this confusion. So we have the world's most expensive, most disorganized, um, and most incomplete health care system. Um, and yet, somewhat unexpectedly, at least as of a few months ago, there is also an opportunity to pass some meaningful legislation right now. Um, we see a conversation taking place uh, within at least the Democratic Party, uh, which has a very slim but majority control of Congress over how to proceed. You may have seen a news report yesterday in the Washington Post. Um, there is a big discussion right now over what way forward, you know, what, what, how to move ahead to get towards universal coverage, which I, I think is a goal particularly today, but has always been a goal that the Democratic Party as a whole shares, but how quickly to get there, what it looks like at the end point is something about which there's a great deal of disagreement. And of course, I think that if you're gonna understand how to go forward, the best way is to learn from the past. And that's a big reason why I wrote the 10 year war. Um, uh, and, you know, I always, I always like to start, I, I, I like to tell us a story and I think you need to understand the basics of health Care. I suspect this audience knows it mostly, but just to review very quickly, um, health insurance in this country, uh, as we know it, really came into existence in the early 20th century, around the time that medicine entered the modern era. Uh, and for the first time, people couldn't pay their medical bills. Um, every country around the world has faced this situation. Every other developed country in the world at one point or another in the 20th century decided that the simplest way to deal with this was to recognize the basic economics of insurance, that at any one time, there's a small group of people generating most of the medical bills. So if you get everybody together in one big pool and you have a nice random group, then everybody can contribute a small amount and everyone will be taken care of. Uh, when they have an injury, when they're sick. Uh, and so they created national health insurance systems of some kind, and they took different forms, but you know, at a sort of 30,000 foot level, they all look the same. They are rest on these large groups of people. Everybody is in, the government manages the spending. Now we of course did not do that. There was talk of doing it in the New Deal. Franklin Roosevelt declined. He thought it was too politically difficult. And that left it to the private sector and the story, and some of you may know this story. If you read my book, you definitely know this story, uh, is that in Dallas, Texas, at the time of the Great Depression, uh, Baylor Hospital was like many hospitals in real trouble. They had uh, wards full of patients who couldn't pay their bills. And so they decided that the superintendent, former superintendent of the Dallas schools was in charge of the hospital. Hospital. And he went to the school teachers that he used to be in charge of and said, hey, why don't we set up this, we'll, we'll do this health care plan, it'll be prepayment, you'll pay a small sum of money every month. And then if you get sick, or you get injured, you come to Baylor Hospital, we'll take care of you. And uh, the legend is that there was a, a school teacher on Christmas Day, 1929, she slipped on the ice, needed her ankle set, went to Baylor Hospital, got it set, and uh, went to pay her bill and they told her, no, 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 you're, you're all taken care of. And that was the beginning of health insurance in the United States as we know it. Um, and that plan grew and then in Minneapolis, one branch, a hospital, they marketed it with, they thought they used the blue crosses that were on nurses uniforms. And that's how it became the blue cross system. And that really became the basis for American health insurance. Um, the idea of focusing it around the workplace mathematically worked because you had a sufficiently large random group of people. Um, there were then several policy decisions that reinforced that. We had wage and price controls in World War II. The IRS decided not to count group health insurance towards taxes. And basically by the 40s and 50s, we're sort of on this path towards an employer healthcare system, which is great for people who are good enough at least, for people who have long-term employment 
had good jobs. And of course that leaves out a lot of people. Um, it left out the elderly. It left out uh, people who were too poor to pay their premiums or didn't have jobs that provided coverage. And one last factor was it left out people who didn't have large employers and had pre-existing medical conditions. And that's because as the insurance industry realized that you could make healthcare work, they started to sell not just to employers, but also to individuals, but they were very careful who they sold to. They screened for risk. So they said to people, if you have pre-existing conditions, we're not going to give you coverage or we'll give you coverage, but we won't cover the pre-existing condition or we will give you coverage and we won't cut. We'll maybe cover the pre-existing conditions where we're going to charge you a lot more. So you had these various groups of people who um, didn't have ways to get health insurance. We did have one big success in the 1960s with the enactment of Medicare and Medicaid to take care of all of the elderly through uh, basically a government run system. And then Medicaid helps some narrow groups of low income people. And this system grew. And really, if you kind of look at the you sort of, you know, growth of health insurance in the United States, the sort of 70s, early 70s, late 60s is kind of peak coverage prior to the Affordable Care Act, because you really get to the point where most, about nine in 10 people in the country have coverage. Um, but at that point, we start backsliding for a couple of reasons. Uh, very high on the list, healthcare just gets a lot more expensive. We don't have a way to control it because we haven't created one of these national health insurance systems. And we have all these newly insured people who are consuming healthcare and technology is advancing. Um, and that all set the stage for the big battle that happened in the 1990s. And that's actually where my book starts. And I started my book with the fight over the Clinton healthcare plan for a very deliberate reason. And that is, um, I believed this when I started my book. By the time I was done reporting my book, I believe this even more strongly. The psychological effects of the Clinton healthcare plan were so uh, powerful. Um, I think they had such a defining effect on the Affordable Care Act because that experience looms so large in the minds of the people who ended up writing the ACA. Now, some of you remember this, some of you may not, but I always like to remind people that there was a time when it seemed like Bill Clinton was gonna succeed. Uh, people forget there were a few moments in 92 and 93, he was this young, energetic president. He had you know, the Fleetwood Mac song, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow on the campaign trail. He gets into office, he sets up this task force. It, you know, it didn't, task force didn't really work too well, but he gave this speech before Congress, which I think is one of the most legendary speeches before Congress, among other things, because it turned, we learned later that this was his big address to explain the healthcare plan. And they loaded the wrong speech into the teleprompter. And actually for like the first seven, eight minutes, he had to kind of wing it because he didn't have his reading glasses. But you know, he's Bill Clinton, that's what he does. And he gave this great speech. And um, you know, the polling after that looked really good. And Hillary Clinton, remember Hillary Clinton? She went up to Capitol Hill, she gave testimony and she, she did what Hillary Clinton does, which was she completely uh, impressed everybody. You know, she had this great command of the details. And it really, you know, I think there were a decent number of people who thought, oh yeah, you know, Bill Clinton's going to do this. He's actually going to get us to universal health care. Of course he didn't. The whole thing fell apart. And, and, and what I think is really important to understand, and I spend a lot of time in my book on this, um, is that in the period after the failure of the Clinton health care plan, oh, so much effort went into studying what went wrong, figuring out the strategic mistakes, figuring out the substantive errors, all with a mindset of, we know we're gonna to get to this later. We know we're gonna have another shot at this. And when we have that next time around, when we get that next chance, we're not gonna blow it. And there were a couple of very key lessons that came out of the Clinton healthcare plan. And, 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 and if you just to think about them, I think you can see ahead to how they ended up shaping the ACA. So, so lesson number one was don't mess with people's employer coverage. Um, don't mess with people's coverage in general if you can avoid it, but especially don't mess with people's employer coverage because that was such a political liability of the Clinton plan was this perception that people with employer coverage, which maybe they didn't love and maybe they didn't trust as much as they used to, but they didn't want to give it up because they didn't trust the alternative. So number one, don't mess with employer coverage. Um, number two, big government's bad. And the funny thing was, you know, Clinton was like, you know, a new Democrat. He was trying to blend the sort of liberal goal of universal coverage with the sort of conservative means of relying on the market. But it came off, it scanned to the public 
partly because the way it was portrayed as a big government plan with a lot of taxes and a lot of spending and a lot of regulation. And, you know, to be fair, it did in fact have a lot of spending and a lot of regulation. It didn't look like Medicare. It wasn't a single payer system, but it was a big government plan. So big government was bad. We were still a fundamentally conservative country. Uh, we are still in what I, you know, think of as the Reagan era in terms of the broad mentality. Um, you know, I always think the single best measure of this is sort of the polling that uh, Gallup and Pew have both done over the years of faith in government. It's just remarkable. I mean, it was so high. You got 70 percent uh, during the 60s. You ask people, do you trust government to do the right thing most of the time? And they would say yes. By the time Clinton is president, it's down in the 20s and 30s. And then, by the way, it's still there. Um, and it's just if you're if that is your environment, it's going to be very hard to sell anything that looks like big. Uh, government. So that was a that was a lesson that was taken. Um, you know, another lesson was you can't beat the healthcare industry. Um, the Clinton effort, they tried. There was a lot of work trying to get the different groups, but they didn't succeed as much as they thought they would. And the groups that they had were pretty lukewarm. But really, they did end up really fighting the pharmaceutical industry. They fought the insurers and they lost. And a big lesson was we can't do that. Just we can't beat them. I mean, really going back through history, this was always the problem. Um, they barely got Medicare through, and that involved co-opting some of the groups. Um, Truman, you know, got killed by the AMA and some other groups. Not only those weren't the only reasons they failed, but they were a big reason. So, okay, you can't get uh, past the interest groups. You can't mess with people's insurance, uh, at least if it's employer insurance. Can't look like too much big government. And by the way, given the numbers in Congress, remember, this is an era when no one's talking about getting rid of the filibuster and no one's talking about the sort of way gerrymandering and uh, changes, you know, gives minorities extra power in government. Um, the assumption was you had to get at least a little bit of conservative buy-in. You had to get a little Republican buy-in. I don't think anyone thought there was going to be some grand uh, Democratic Republican agreement on universal health care, but the assumption was you had to have something that would appeal to moderate Republicans. So that was the mindset into which Mitt Romney in Massachusetts appear. Um, and again, this was something else, you know, in sort of when you, when you write a book like this, you sketch it out in advance, you go to your publisher, you say, this is what the outline's going to look like. So I, I, I always had a book that sort of went from the Clinton plan to the Massachusetts plan, because I always knew the Massachusetts plan was important. I have to tell you, in re-interviewing people who were involved with the Obama administration, the Democrats in 2009, 2010, I actually think I underestimated, had underestimated how important the Massachusetts plan was. Partly uh, just as an actual model, but also partly as a sort of catalyst, as a sort of symbol of what they could get done. Because here, you know, Romney is the governor and they, and they, and they passed the Massachusetts healthcare plan. And there are a lot of differences. And I mean, you know, there's this mythology that what they did in Massachusetts was the Affordable Care Act. Well, no, it wasn't. It was different in some very important ways that would become clearer later on. But th that, that, that idea that Massachusetts had gotten over the hump and that they had done it with a Republican governor and they had buy-in from all the groups, that really resonated. I mean, one thing I, I, I didn't appreciate, I, I got to see some of the internal memos uh, from the Obama campaign and from the John Edwards campaign, if you remember John Edwards, because you know he was actually the first guy in 2007 to come out with a health care plan in the Democratic primaries. And it's Massachusetts is all over these. They say, look what they did in Massachusetts. This is really important. And, and when I interviewed President Obama and I said, so how did you land on you know, this health care plan? And I figured I was going to have to prompt him. I mean, he, I didn't, it was like the first thing out of his mouth. He's like, well, we saw what they did in Massachusetts. It really really got their attention. And of course, the plan that they did in Massachusetts really seemed to fit, right? Because the Massachusetts plan, it didn't disrupt employer coverage. It just kind of plugged the holes. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't seem, you know, it wasn't a massive expansion of government because it really the heart of it was this new structured market of competition of private health plans. And of course, it had a Republican buy and it had everyone. You know, there's this meeting I describe, and it's actually also, if you if you go back and read some of the other great books on the affordable character, you can read Paul Starr's book, you read John McDonough's book, they also describe this. There is this meeting in the Prudential Tower, Boston, which if you know Boston, it's this big old uh, towering skyscraper and it's and, and like looks out over the whole city. And it was kind of like, you know, either depending on your on your interpretation, either the Justice League or the Legion of Doom. But, you know, it's like all the keys all the key players were there. The insurers were there. The labor unions were there. The, the uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans were there. And basically, this is after the law passes. And they all got together and they're like, OK, how are we going to make this thing work? 
are we all in? And of course, I, being who I am, I had to mention, you know, the, the sort of symbol of this was the Boston Red Sox Foundation got involved, you know, promoting enrollment. And they had like at Fenway, they had, you know, Massachusetts Healthcare Enrollment Day and everyone was on board with this. And I think that's really important because on the one hand, it was a sign that you could do something that would get everybody in, but also a warning. Because the Massachusetts plan, to the extent that it got good results, and it was by no means perfect, but it did cover most of residents, um, it had everybody rowing in the same direction. Everybody was on board. And you had to wonder, what does this thing look like in practice if you don't get that? So just put, put a pin in that thought, because then, you know, we get to Obama getting elected. And, and now they try to, they're, and, and, and they're trying to, they're going to do health care. And, and I talk in the book, obviously, about the debates internally. Are they going to make health care a priority? Are they not going to make health care a priority? They settled pretty quickly on that. And again, if you're sort of thinking about how did the Democrats get their health care legislation over the line, I think it's just such an important factor that they already knew what they wanted to do. And there was con broad consensus. And I mean, they all had bought into this single vision for better or worse. They had locked themselves into this model. And by, I mean, everybody, I do mean everybody. I mean, Max Baucus, the conservative Senate finance chairman, all the way over to Henry Waxman, who was, you know, liberal crusader for healthcare. They were all on the same page and they got to work. And they had already made a lot of compromises they quickly found they had to make many more compromises. And I always try to emphasize that, that this was a bill that started as a compromise and then they got to Congress and they had to compromise it a lot further. And, and you know, we can go through the various compromises. Some of you are familiar with them already. Um, obviously, there was no public option at the end. They had to get rid of the public option. Um, the uh, regulations on insurers were less aggressive than they wanted. I always come back to, I think, the single biggest uh, sacrifice that was made in the legislative process was on the size of the bill. Um, there was constant pressure to keep the price tag under a trillion dollars over 10 years. Um, and then actually it became that, that even got knocked down a little further as the debate went on. Now, the reasons for that are complex. Um, some of that was political. There was this broadly, widely held perception that you couldn't go over a trillion dollars. It sounded too big. Um, uh, a lot of this, uh, though, was driven by a fact that, you know, in the Democratic Congress of 2009, on the one hand, you had 60 seats. You had a filibuster-proof majority. On the other hand, if you look who was in those 60 seats, you had 12 to 15 senators who were from states that were Republican states. Um, these were Democrats holding onto their seats as legacies, desperate not to seem like they were too far out there to the left, trying to keep a little bit of distance from the uh, Democratic president, trying to keep a little distance from, uh, from their party leadership. And remember, had just come off a stimulus that back in 2009 was thought to be very large. They had just come off bailing out the banks. They had just come off from bailing, off, bailing out the auto industry. And there was just not a lot of enthusiasm to spend a lot of money. And at the same time, they committed, uh, all of the leaders, but especially at the White House, they'd committed themselves to not just paying for the bill, not making sure that it was sort of, uh, everything was offset, but also reducing the deficit. And then, of course, they had to make the deals with industry, which all grew out of the sense that this was the only way to pass a bill. Again, remember the lesson from the Clinton plan. But if you're sort of going in there saying you're not going to spend more than a trillion dollars, you're going to offset it all and actually try to you know, reduce the deficit. And the sort of there's only so much money you can get from the drug industry and the hospital industry and the doctors because you're negotiating with them. Well, that is going to limit what you're going to be able to do. And that is how we got to where we got with uh, what the Affordable Care Act looked like at the end, which was the, the, the model of the law. It was what they went in looking for. I mean, it, you know, if you look at the architecture of it, it looks remarkably similar to, you know, Obama's campaign plan or the white paper that Senator Max Baucus introduced at the beginning, uh, at the very end of 2008. I mean, the architecture really didn't change, but the dollars changed, the numbers changed. It was less generous. And that meant it was going to cover fewer people, but also that the coverage people we're going, was, we're, was going to get was going to be less generous. And I feel like looking ahead, if you look at how the ACA played out in practice, that was such a big factor because with a less generous plan, it meant that when people got their insurance through the marketplace, for those who were getting it through the marketplace, for that middle class group who were buying on their own, um, they were looking at much higher prices. They were looking at bigger deductibles. And uh, especially for people who had coverage before, 
um, people who were in the individual market, they were accustomed to paying a lot less for their coverage. Now, people who understood healthcare could say to them, well, yeah, you were getting cheap insurance before, but guess what? It was really crappy coverage. You know, if you got really sick, it probably wasn't going to, you know, you were going to, you know, there's a good chance you would hit that annual limit or you'd go over a lifetime limit. Or maybe you discover you needed a mental health care or you needed certain prescriptions and that wasn't covered. Um, and by the way, uh, if you got really sick, there was a pretty good chance they were going to go through your medical records and lo and behold, discover something from five years ago that no one ever thought was anything but they would decide was evidence that you had a pre-existing condition, they wouldn't pay any of your bills. And that's assuming you could even get coverage in the first place, because reality is if you had a pre-existing condition and were trying to buy coverage for the first time, you would not be able to. So this more expensive insurance was for most people still probably better coverage, but it didn't feel like better coverage. And that really fueled the backlash. And you had a whole bunch of people who frankly could not afford these new policies. Now, there was a second half of the Affordable Care Act. It got very let, so much less attention during the debate and even in the years following, uh, which was the Medicaid expansion. It was sort of kind of like not, you know, among people who followed health policy, they understood it was important, but it really didn't get much attention in the debates. And on the merits, I think if you look at the places where it was implemented, uh, it was by far the most successful part of the Affordable Care Act, um, where states expanded Medicaid, um, ensuring, you know, People got insurance. It was good insurance. They got the access that they needed. Um, uh, the studies that we've done since then on the impact of the Medicaid expansion really show unambiguously that people are, 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 are getting better access to care. They're experiencing less financial distress. Um, they're seeing improvements in health. It's really not, uh, not a close call at this point. Of course, the problem with Medicaid expansion was, uh, thanks in part to the Supreme Court, a lot of states didn't expand. And even today, we have a dozen states that haven't expanded Medicaid. And of course, it includes some of the biggest states in the country, Florida, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina. Um, that's a few million people right there. Um, and so here we have the part of the Affordable Care Act that in theory uh, 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 could, is doing the most good and yet it's not reaching everyone it could. Um, and, and, and that set up, I think, an environment uh, of sort of ambivalence about the ACA for even among its would-be supporters uh, throughout its uh, existence. And of course, on top of that all, you had the normal problems of implementing a new program. Um, when you pass something that is complex like this, when you do a big program, it is to be expected there will be problems. It is to be expected that things will not always look like you thought they would look like. That is just the reality. And normally what you do in the normal way that our government is supposed to function is that you would make adjustments as you go. You go to Congress and say, gee, you know, maybe this looks a little different than we thought. Hey, we sort of expected the market to gravitate towards more generous plans, but it seems like they're generating more towards narrow network plans that are cheaper. So maybe we need to just have some extra protections there to make sure people can get to the doctors they need or they understand what they're buying. Or maybe we need to sort of, hey, we're really having the trouble in these sort of rural areas, uh, keeping the prices down because there's not a lot of provider competition. Maybe we need to do something about that. And the problem was, of course, um, there were no opportunities to make those adjustments because from day one, the opposition party, the Republican Party, wanted nothing to do with this. Now, remember, that had been one of the goals of the ACA was to get Republican buy-in. And I have to say, going back in the reporting and reading some of the memos and, and, and seeing readouts of early meetings in late 2008 and early 2009 and listening to people like Charles Grassley, who was the ranking Republican on the Finance Committee, or Orrin Hatch, who had this very close relationship with Ted Kennedy. Um, they were, you can understand, I can certainly understand, and I have to talk about this more in the Q&A, um, why some Democrats thought there was a chance to get some buy-in there. I, I don't think it was ever realistic, but I don't think it was as crazy as it seems now. Um, they were talking optimistically about it, and it's not for me to say who believed what, you know, whether it was genuine or not, but it, it wasn't, insane to think in late 2008, early 2009, that you might be able to get a handful of Republicans to support some version of this. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, and in fact, uh, not only did it not happen, but the opposition only intensified after the law passed in, in opposition to the usual um, way this evolved. Um, one of my net metrics I always use is that Jim DeMint, who really, I, I think, as much as anybody symbolized the opposition to the Affordable Care Act, you know, he introduced 
a bill uh, to repeal the Affordable Care Act. It was one sentence, you know, the ACA is repealed. I mean, that was basically the bill. It had uh, 20, I had look up the number, I think it was 22 co-sponsors in 2010. Well, right after the midterms, when the Republicans make huge gains, they, they take over the House, they make big gains in the Senate, um, he reintroduces the bill. And this time, every single Republican in the caucus signs onto it. I think that tells you where they're going. That, that, that opposition, white hot opposition became sort of the defining de facto position of the Republican Party. And, and it created a self-fulfilling cycle politically, because if you said you were against Obamacare, it riled up your supporters, it got you onto Fox News, which then got you donations, which then got you more votes. And anybody who dissented was punished, and it became the party line. And we saw this over and over again. I think sort of the uh, most obvious example of this was the government shutdown of uh, 2013, uh, which was led by Ted Cruz and Dement, who at that point was running the Heritage Foundation, was out of the Senate, um, and then uh, supported by the Freedom Caucus, which wasn't yet called the Freedom Caucus. Um, and uh, basically, you know, shutting down the government to defund the Affordable Care Act, even though there was basically no way for that to actually work. I mean, even many Republicans knew that didn't work. And I, I haven't seen John Boehner's new book, but I know he thought it was a terrible idea. Lots of Republicans, some said it publicly, but they all went for it. And of course it didn't work. But the amazing thing about the government shutdown from 2013 was, I, I, I would say by any rational uh, uh, assessment, that was a failure because at the end of the day, uh, Democrats went ahead and got their concessions on their government. They were the Affordable Care Act was not defunded, and actually Republicans fell on the polls. But to Republicans, uh, they considered that a victory, and conservatives actually took that as a lesson that their leadership had been too feckless. And that was the mindset, and it kind of powered them all the way through up through the Trump election, so that when they got power in government, they Trump got elected, Republicans had the House and Senate, they were finally ready to repeal the Affordable Care Act. But of course. Something very important to recognize, and, 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 and this is one of the big themes of the book, is that if you look at where the Republicans were in 2017, and you look at where the Democrats were in 2009, there is this stark difference. And the difference is Democrats, as we were talking about before, they spent 10 years building up to that moment. Um, they spent all this time preparing, doing the white papers, all the sort of stuff that to the outside world seems really boring or pointless. But to the people inside the Democratic Party, to the organizers, to the officials, it meant that come 2009, they were ready to go. And even then, it was, it, it was, it was the, 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 they faced steep political odds, and they almost didn't succeed. But they were ready to go. They'd worked out the big questions. They had the policy uh, knowledge. They understood how to message it. And they had all kind of gotten onto the same page. Well, the Republican in 2017 had done none of that. They had done none of that work. And there's a whole complex set of reasons why, and I can talk about it later or you can see it in the book. But I, I think what the most remarkable thing was in interviewing Republicans about this and talking to former Republican staff, former Republican staffers, uh, uh, former Republican officials, even Tom Price, uh, who was HHS secretary under Trump, uh, basically saying on the record, yeah, we weren't ready. We had not done this work. And it meant that when they finally got their chance, they suddenly discovered something that Democrats had known all along, which is that healthcare policy is really pretty complicated. And they were not, they hadn't worked out the common message. They hadn't figured out the particulars. And they were, and it showed. It showed because they weren't prepared for things like the CBO saying, hey, guess what? If you dramatically reduce the funding, you take that especially for Medicaid and you take away, you weaken the uh, protections for pre-existing conditions and you devolve a bunch of things to the states, you're going to end up with like, you know, yes, you know, you'll reduce government spending, which is what you want. And you can you can give people a tax cut, which is what you want. But you're also going to end up with 20 plus million people without health insurance. And it was amazing to me. I knew that. Anybody who following healthcare knew that, but most of the Republicans had not realized they were going to see that kind of CBO score. They also hadn't agreed on what they even wanted to do. They were in dramatically different camps. You had some who basically were like, we just want to get rid of this thing altogether. We want to radically move in a more conservative direction on healthcare. You had some people who were like, well, you know, we want to scale it back, but we want to leave some parts in place. And frankly, you had a big part of the, of the, of the Republicans in Congress who, who frankly hadn't given it much thought. They wanted to beat Obamacare and they really had not spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I think a big reason that, and, and this is not me talking, this is a quote from a former Republican staffer, Republicans don't do healthcare. They do national security, they do taxes, they don't do healthcare. There are exceptions, 
But for general, the party just has not spent decades thinking about that. And I think that all came together and it goes a long way to explaining why they were not able to get their repeal bill across the, across the line uh, and, and they failed and why the Affordable Care Act is still here. Because at the end of the day, having not done that work, I think they failed to realize that for all of its problems, for all of its flaws, and you know, there were a lot of them, for all the mistakes that made, for all the things you can look back and say, gosh, this was not, not a really great decision with the Affordable Care Act, it still had done a lot of good it had meant so much to so many people, uh, so many millions had gotten coverage that trying to take that way uh, with nothing to replace it uh, was not politically tenable. And I feel like that is where we are here. And so, you know, the question of where we go forward, um, I, you know, we can talk about that in the Q&A, but I think, you know, sort of, I sort of draw two really important lessons from the Affordable Care Act experience. So one is the policy lesson. And, and, and to me, I look back at the ACA especially the marketplace part, as, as, as an attempt, like I said, really similar you know, in its DNA, similar to the Clinton effort, to kind of take this liberal goal of universal coverage and get there through the conservative means of capturing competition and markets and relying on private health insurance. And, and, and just from the standpoint of on the merits as a policy proposition, um, I, I, I don't think it's a great way to go. I think we've seen that trying to get those markets to work is very difficult. I think uh, competition uh, is great in some contexts, but it's just inherently a bad fit for healthcare. Um, and, and you don't have to have a sort of rose colored view of government. Uh, you, you, can, you can think government is prone to all kinds of bureaucratic excess that it can, you know, especially in the United States that you know, federal officials might not be the greatest at managing a large program. But at the end of the day, I think we look at the prog healthcare programs in this country that work, that don't. And I think you know, the, the, the lesson is that uh, more public control is better. Simplicity is better. Um, reducing people's individual exposure to healthcare is uh, expensive is better. And I feel like that is the direction we want to go. And if and if moving that direction eventually takes us to Medicare for all or something that looks like Medicare for all, really anything that looks like any of the European systems, I think that is something on the merits is very defensible. I think you can look at those systems abroad and say they get pretty good results. And I think most Americans would happily take that. So in terms of a direction to move, I think that makes a lot of sense. But I also think the other lesson of the Affordable Care Act is that, you know, they got it done. Healthcare is hard. There's a reason everybody before them failed. And I think the lesson there is that it takes a lot of work and that incremental wins sometimes, they're frustrating, they're disappointing, but you have to take them because that's the only way forward. And that doesn't mean you are blind. Uh, to the flaws. It doesn't mean you pretend everything is perfect. It doesn't mean that you pretend we don't have 20 plus million people walking around without coverage today. But I do think it means you, you, you stop and say, hey, you take a big win when you see one. You take a victory when it's there. And you recognize that as progress. You say, this is something we can build on, uh, something to celebrate, and then move forward. So that is the two lessons I take. Um, that's where I think we are with the Affordable Care Act. And uh, now I'll take some questions. Great. Well, let me say, thank you, Jonathan, so much. Let me start off with a couple of questions that I have. Let me start with one of the things that really puzzles me. Uh, why, why was healthcare.gov so cosmically fucked up? It seems like it's, it's you know, Amazon can build a website. Uh, that was such a humiliating uh, disaster. And, and those of us that lived through that, can you say a little bit about why that happened and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. why it was hard to, you know, I, I still find that kind of unfathomable. Yeah, um, it was a huge failure and not just a huge failure in the short term, but I think so much about that, what I was mentioning or the impediment to, 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 to change being lack of faith in government. Um, and, and actually I was thinking Obama thought about it a lot, right? You know, sort of we need to reinvigorate faith that we can do these things right, that government can solve your problems. And this was like such the chance to get this right. And screwing that up was just set that cause back in such a huge way. Um, it, was a, it was a terrible failure. Um, and, you know, as is always the case, why was it a failure? Well, there was a bunch of reasons. So let's, let's first not minimize the task. Um, and, and, you know, Obama used to talk about, it's going to be like, you know, buying, you know, Amazon, books on Amazon, or, you know, airline tickets on Expedia, or, mm -hmm kayak or whatever. Well, it's not, right? I mean, it was much more complex. You had 
you had to create a system that sort of established eligibility. It had to verify. I mean, it had to deal with so many different federal and state computer systems. I mean, a huge part is remember there was so much anxiety about, you know, uh, coverage of undocumented residents, right? So you really had to make sure you didn't let those, you know, you know, can you just imagine how scared they were of, of that? So that meant, you know, talking to Homeland Security computers and just, so it was a really hard job. Let's not minimize that, just to be clear. Also, um, they were dealing with some very stiff political headwinds. Um, there was a fear that if you were too public about any of those sort of problems, um, if you know that, you know, you would be attacked for it. I mean, there was a sense that you could not admit publicly to any errors. Now, throw into that a fairly common political problem, um, but one that I think proved quite consequential here, at least according to everyone I talked to, which was that, um, you know, the timing the exchanges opened, which healthcare.gov was going to manage, right? Opened late 2013. Um, it required a whole bunch of guidance and regulations to be issued so that insurers would know how to price their products and also for the design of the website. And uh, as is often the case, the Obama administration was very nervous about putting out guidance and regulations in the immediate lead up to the 2012 election. Um, this, this happens every presidency, because when you're issuing a guidance or a regulation, very frequently, you're going to make the people, someone's going to be happy, someone's not going to be happy, the people who are unhappy are going to be a lot louder than the people who are happy. Um, so there was a push to delay a lot of these regulations. Um, I think that created a time crunch. You had a lot of the sort of familiar problems of federal contracting. I mean, this is just not something that the federal government was set up to do well. I do think, by the way, that they've done taken some steps to fix that. And then finally, I, you know, look, I think some of this is on the people who were in charge. And I think the people who were in charge, you know, you have to, I, I say that as someone who, who, who thinks in the overall, you know, tally, you know, look at all the things they accomplished. But I mean, there was, uh, there was, uh, there's a very strong case that there were some bad management decisions. And I, I actually, spend some time trying to litigate and figure out where that responsibility lied. I finally gave up because I don't think I could know. I don't, I don't know, you know, I, I would need to be closer. It's a great OIG report on this, I think was quite helpful. Steve Brill obviously wrote a book about it. Um, but there were failures, clearly there was confusion. It was not clear who, where, you know, where did the buck stop? People were either afraid to sort of report bad news up the line or didn't know where to report it to. Um, but, you know, I think there were management failures, but I, I, as I say in the book, I think at the end of the day, wherever in the sort of chain of command those failures were, at the end of the day, the buck stops at the top. And I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, who, you know, whose responsibility was it? It was the president's responsibility, which by the way, he, you know, he, he <laughs> when I asked him, I said, so what's your biggest regret? And he immediately said, he said, healthcare.gov, still my, still my biggest self-inflicted wound. Um, so he knows it. And, you know, like I said, I think, you know, to their credit, I think afterwards they, they, they really tried to kind of reinvent the, the IT process in the federal government. So, you know, a complex story like everything else. So uh, some questions that, uh, and, and comments in the chats. Uh, one is, how do you think the ACA and more broadly the healthcare landscape will now change under the Biden presidency? Yeah, so, I mean, we're debating that right now. Um, and, you know, there's internal debates. And again, there was a story in the post yesterday, I want to say by Jeff Stein, talking about some of the tensions there are. So there's a, uh, uh, let's just take a step back. Um, relative to say 2009, I think there's probably, uh, uh, well, there's a lot of unity among the Democrat, inside the Democratic Party about the general, they all, everyone in the Democratic Party wants to move towards more affordable healthcare for everyone. Everyone would like to get to a place where there's universal coverage. Let's sort of stipulate that. Um, obviously you have some differences, uh, both in sort of how quickly to go, and sort of what that plan looks like at the end, there's a secondary set of uh, differences, which is more strategic in nature about how you prioritize things, what you do when. And so, I mean, there is the sort of push to sort of, you know, the American Rescue Plan, the COVID relief bill, added a lot to the subsidies that are available through the exchanges, um, also made some more Medicaid money available. So there's a desire to make some of that permanent. Um, there is a push, uh, especially from people like Senator Sanders uh, to really move in the direction of more public coverage, both by beefing up Medicare um, and uh, opening it up to sort of younger people, you know, having a 55 or 60, let people buy in strain at 55 or 60. Um, uh, there is separately a big push to do something on prescription drug coverage and get the government more involved in drug pricing. There's the idea of having a public option. Now, 
in theory, and I haven't even gone into the sort of part, of, uh, which is was part of the first jobs proposal that Biden made, which is to really dramatically improve um, home and community-based services under Medicaid uh, for long-term care. Now, in principle, these things are not in conflict. You could do all of them. And in fact, the prescription drug piece, you want to pair with something because in theory, that saves you money that you can then use to pay for the other ones, which are all cost money. Um, the problem is that uh, not unlike in the Affordable Care Act situation, there are trade-offs to be made. I mean, at some point, uh, you either, you know, all of these things cost money except for the prescription drug part. Uh, the prescription drug part requires going to war with the drug, uh, drug industry and getting votes in the Democrats very thin among with very thin democratic majorities and by the way um if you're thinking about the democratic votes you worry about um i know we're all used to worrying about joe manchin and kirsten cinema and the senate but on drug policy the names you want to be watching are menendez in new jersey carper in delaware uh and and, and keep in mind that you know delaware is very close to biden um biden is close to the drug industry so i mean these are complicated pieces. And, and sort of the, I think the question going forward is how do these pieces fit together? What are you going to do first? What are you going to do later? And this, this, this tension between Sanders, who wants to very much like you know, sort of the next train leaving the station, he wants to be, let's do some stuff on Medicare versus Pelosi, who next train leaving the station, she wants to be ACA enhancements. It's not really a substantive disagreement so much as a strategic one, but they're going to have to figure that out. Um, Question from uh, Colleen Murphy. Uh, you talked about employer coverage being a sacred cow. Do you see a future in the U.S. where employers have no role in health insurance? Yeah. So, I mean, I remember when I first started writing on healthcare, like back in the dark ages, probably talking to some of the people on the webinar here. And I think like a lot of people who start looking at healthcare, like you, you, you sort of learn about it for the first time and you're like, wow, is this employer system dumb? We should really get rid of it. And then you have the realization like, employers should recognize that this is a dumb system. I mean, why do they like this? Um, they should want to get rid of it. And I live in Michigan. So like I'm around the auto industry and like you always hear like, you know, the cost of every car includes this huge component of whatever. And I even wrote articles. Now that I read articles that employers should want to get out of the health insurance business. I've written articles back then saying that employers are moving in that direction. I had a big article, employers are finally seeing the light. So here I am, I'm here to say that they have not seen the light. Um, and I don't know that they ever will. And I finally realized there's a couple of, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, there, there, there's a couple factors I'm, I'm focusing on this one. There's, you know, I think in general, the sort of willingness of the American people to give up employer coverage is a whole other factor, bigger than I think some realize, but let's, I don't, let's just put that aside. Let's just talk about the employers themselves. And, and I've discovered that there's like a couple factors here. I mean, so one is they like the leverage. Um, this is a power management labor, capital labor issue. Um, employers like the leverage over their employers. They like the control. They believe they can control costs better than the federal government can. Um, uh, and there is an ideological framework to this all, which is even if they believe that on the merits, government might be doing, a, might be able to handle healthcare. It just runs against their instincts to want to have the government getting more involved in something that's private sector. And even to the extent that you have CEOs who I think are more inclined to, to think, oh, you know, I look at, geez, my German subsidiary seem, they seem to do real well with that German healthcare system over there and, you know, Japan and France and Switzerland, whatever. Um, you know, the fact is like, they're human beings like everybody else and they have their social circles. And I think, you know, if you're the CEO of, you know, let's say Ford Motor Company and you're thinking, yeah, you know, actually uh, let's, I, could, I, could, I could go with getting rid of this employer system and just letting the government take it off my hands. Well, and then I go to the business round table and, and, and to my right is the CEO of Pfizer. To, to my left is the CEO of United Health. And when I go back home and I go to the charity auction, there's the sort of you know, board chair of the local hospital and the doctor who was my roommate in college. And guess what? Uh, they're all telling me not to let this happen. And, and, and that's got a powerful effect. So I think all of those are sort of very powerful effects that are propping up this system. Um, 
I, you know, maybe someday we erode it. I mean, I could see it eroding, but I kind of feel like it's going to have to take time. Uh, I will say this, if anything was going to sort of really dislodge the employer coverage, the employer system, I would have thought it would have been a really big jolt to employment, which we just went through. And, you know, I didn't see, I mean, obviously there were people talking about it. Bernie Sanders talks about it. He does a great job. He's a great, articulates this so well, but I just don't think you're, we're there. The, um, uh, some more questions. I'll, I'll resist the temptation to follow up with my own questions, at least for the moment. Uh, do you see, uh, Ronald Cohen asks, uh, do, you, do you think the lawsuits currently in the courts pose a threat to Obamacare or not? Yeah. So the main one, right, is there's the case that was heard in November, um, which calls on the Supreme Court to wipe away, you know, the, 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 the plaintiffs want the court to wipe away the entire law. Um, so on the merits, this is by far the kookiest, dumbest of the major challenges. Those are technical terms, by the way, kookiest and dumbest uh, challenges to come before the court. Um, conservative lawyers say that, by the way. Uh, there's, there's, it's really hard to find a respectable legal expert who takes those cases seriously. Um, and if you listen to oral argument, um, I counted three justices, three conservative justices, openly skeptical of the plaintiff's arguments in this. When you put that together with three liberals, that's six, three. Um, so if you were betting, you'd say, yeah, the ACA is gonna survive this and this case will get dismissed as every respectable legal expert thinks it should. Um, does that mean it's sure to happen? No, I mean, look, this thing won in district court. Um, it did not get knocked down in circuit court. I mean, the circuit court opinion was a little complex, but in general, they sort of bought the argument. Um, you're betting now without Ginsburg on the court, you are betting that uh, not just Roberts, who has stood up for the ACA twice now, but you're betting that he can pull at least one other conservative. And we really don't know. We haven't seen Kavanaugh in a decision like this. Um, you know, who knows the Gorsuch and Alito um, it's really, it's, 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 it's very, it's very hard to say. Um, I, my bet is it survived, the ACA survives, but you know, uh, you know, it's a small, small, small chance, horrible consequences if it happens. Uh, question from Emma Sando. Uh, do you, how do you think the Medicaid expansion politics in states has changed from what they were in 2012. Is there any chance of the remaining 12 states passing Medicaid expansion given the current political makeup? Yeah, I mean, so the most hopeful sign, right, is these uh, are these ballot initiatives that are, 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 are get, you know, have sort of pushed it over the line in a number of very red states. And I'm sure Emma is following. So Emma, Emma knows more, you know, follows more about Medicaid than anybody on the planet. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the Missouri, um, you know, Missouri passed it now the state legislature, some Republicans in the state legislature are trying to block it. It looks like they will fail. And that's a situation like Maine, where potentially they could hold out for a while, but seems unlikely. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I keep wondering, like, I would have thought by now in a state like Florida or Texas or Georgia, where, I mean, the budget math seems so compelling to me and we're far enough now removed from the ACA fights, you would have thought. Um, and certainly I've heard over the years in Florida, Georgia and Texas and North Carolina for that matter, I've spoken to people who thought credibly there was a kind of something happening in the legislature and they're gonna figure out a way to do it that you know looks like, they won't call it Medicaid expansion and, you know, or maybe they'll use work requirements, which of course not, doesn't like happen, can't happen now. So I don't know. I mean, you, you sort of wonder, I've always been of the opinion that eventually all the states will, will opt in, but I don't know what it takes or how long. Um, you would think we're not far in Georgia, given the political situation there, maybe even Texas. Florida is such a weird state. I mean, that's just... I grew up there. So, I mean, I know this well. It, the politics of Florida are just hard to figure out right now. So I guess I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. So I think eventually, but I think it's just this really slow wearing down process. A question about this, the term Obamacare. You know, we call the ACA Obamacare. What is distinctively Obama about Obamacare? If we had, if it were like Edwards Care or Clinton Care or they were president instead of President Obama, 
What do you think, if anything, would have been different about, about what we've all experienced? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I think the single biggest impact of Obama on Obamacare is that it exists. In that looking back over the history of the fight to pass the ACA, um, I think you plug in different presidents. I think many of them, it just doesn't happen because it took, and, and I think this is, I mean, when, I, when people say, you know, is this, is it, does Obama deserve to call this his legacy? And I think he does. And I think um, there were really three points in particular when, more than three, but three I always think about when it would have been so easy to walk away. Um, there's the period before he actually, right at the beginning of his presidency and the transition when he's getting lots of pressure just to scale back, among others from Joe Biden, by the way, uh, because the economy is so pressing and he insists on pressing far. And that was him. Um, that was him. And, and, and he will tell you he never really entertained doubts, even though people around him were they're like, he was happy to listen to the arguments, but he was always moving ahead. Um, there's the period in August of 2009 uh, when the Tea Party protests are really flaring up all over the country and the polling has gone just in the tank. And he's like, no, no, we're going to go forward. And then in January after Scott Brown, um, now there, uh, it was him. It was also, I think, other, you know, I think that's, if you're going to tell that story, there's more, the, the, a bigger part of that story than in others is Nancy Pelosi in particular, but certainly he's part of it. And, and just that kind of ability to sort of set a goal, to think big. And I, I was, I feel like this is half the reason I wrote the book. People look back at the ACA, they're like, God, it's so weak and it's so compromised. And I just want to like remind you that like in 2009, that was hugely ambitious. That was so pushing the envelope of what people thought was possible back then, judging by the sort of political circumstances of the time. And I really think that was his impact, was to push it forward. And, and I'll just say one more thing, which is, you know, he's a substantive person. He's very wonky. I think sometimes that cuts both ways. Um, there were certainly times when I think he was overly technical. Um, he sometimes, you know, he got lost in the weeds himself. He would have made a fine public policy professor. Uh, the flip side is, and I thought, I, I, I thought this was such a telling sort of comparison. If you're looking at the ACA in 2010 and then repeal in 2017, and just, I, and there's passages in my book where I describe this, Obama negotiating with the Democrats. He, he's personally conducting these meetings among sort of democratic lawmakers. He's like deep in the weeds of like, you know, what the sort of Medicare reimbursement rates in Wisconsin are. Uh, and he can do that, right? And he can talk, he can talk about, he can also talk at a moral level about how important this is. He can really kind of, you know, call, conjure up the sort of identity of the Democratic Party. Now contrast that with Trump, who basically there's a story in the book where, you know, he's got Charlie Dent in there, who's a Pennsylvania moderate Republican. And he's like, are you going to vote for this? And Dent's like, well, no, I have problems. He's like, I'm done with you. He literally puts him, give him the hand. And then he comes back. He's like, are you still against me? He's like, I'm going to blame this on you. Now, admittedly, Trump is like a caricature of that. But like, the fact is, like, in general, I think there was a lot of politicians who just don't take the sort of substance that seriously. And I think Obama, by taking it that seriously, again, I don't think it's so much on the design of the ACA, what it looks like. It's the fact that it exists, that it got over the hump. By the way, one thing that, two points that, on what you just raised. One is I remember I was in a meeting with a bunch of Democratic and Republican Congress people in early 2017. And what was amazing was how glum a lot of the Republicans were and also how uninformed, how, really how they were not health people, even though this was, actually, this was uh, a meeting where uh, a lot of policy wonks like Gail Walensky was there, or Vic Roy, people like that. And I remember some of the Republican congressmen didn't know, for example, what this what the uh, Center for Budget and Policy Priorities was, and they were just, they were by the way equally smart as their Democratic colleagues. They were just not into the same issues, and 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 a bunch of them were like, "This is going to be terrible. We're kind of, we're going to be laughed out of town if we don't do something." And it's kind of we're kind of stuck doing it. Uh, second thing, I I do think one thing that is distinctively Obama is many of the public felt he was too black. And, um, you know, that it racialized American health politics in a way that the Clinton plan did not. And, and I, how much do you think that 
th that factored into the sort of venomous response to the ACA. Uh, I think what Obama himself personified. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's and, and there's I, race comes up a lot in the book for that reason. It was a huge factor. I mean, I, I always I, I come back to one incident constantly. I just think is so symbolic of this, and especially in our current moment, especially kind of um, revealing about public perceptions but um i remember you may remember he gave a press con obama gives a press conference in july of 2009 and the tea party is already starting up and he, he's gonna it's gonna be a healthcare uh press conference only time in my life i've been at a prime time white house press conference and i was very excited i was a little nervous i don't i'll be honest and um because they sat me in the front row and it was like network anchor network anchor network anchor and jonathan Cohn. And, and, and clearly there was a reason for that, which was this was going to be a healthcare conference. And he was going to go through Jake Tapper and Chuck Todd and blah, blah, blah. And they, would see, and they figured, and, you know, it's me, right? I'm going to ask like a wonky question, which I was. Um, right before he got to me, he decides he's going to, he's not going to, he stops to my disappointment. And he instead calls on uh, the reporter, uh, Lynn Sweet uh, from Chicago, your neighborhood. Yeah. And, and, and what is the question? The question is about, the other night, Professor Henley Lewis Gates in Cambridge was arrested uh, while he was trying to get into his house. Can you comment on that? And of course he did. And I remember thinking at the time, this is all we're going to be talking about for the next week. I mean, he had just given this very elegant policy seminar on healthcare. Nah, no one's going to pay attention to that. Um, but what's especially revealing about that is, you know, if you look at his answer, it's the most Obama answer ever, right? I mean, it's careful. It's like, well, I don't want to sort of prejudge anything, whatever, but it does, you do sort of wonder this professor, maybe there was a race element. And like, the, that is a, he says in his memoir, he talks about this, single biggest drop in his polls in this presidency was after that. And the reaction was, and this is what I think is so revealing. Henry Louis Gates arrested for trying to get into his own house in Cambridge. And the reaction of the country was Obama racialized it. I mean, think about that. I mean, that's, that, 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 that tells you everything. Um, and uh, I, I mean, you can't separate the racial aspect of this. And, 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 and I, I wish I'd be really careful. I, I, entirely possible to oppose the Affordable Care Act, be a, an Obamacare hater for reasons that have nothing to do with race. You'd be false soft. I, I'm not, I would never suggest that you are anti-Obamacare, you're racist. I'm not saying that. But I don't think it's at all possible to understand both the, 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 the opposition and the depth of that opposition without a knowing race is in there. It is, by the way, Colleen Grogan is here and she has a very nice analysis with Ethan Park showing you know, a lot of the states that have, have a high proportion of African-Americans are, were the first to reject the Medicaid expansion. And now I should say that there's also, if you think about Alec McGillis's interviews in West Virginia and other places, there's a lot of moralized opposition to the Medicaid expansion, which was not racial, which was like, my cousin is a complete screw up and yep. he has better health insurance than I do because of Medicaid. And that's, uh, and I don't like that. I mean, there's, yep. I mean, the sense of Medicaid expansion is helping the undeserving is, Huge. is a, is a real thing. Uh, the, yeah, um, um, by one of the points Michael Massal put in the chat, the very poignant reality that, that uh, states that did not expand Medicaid left critically needed money on the table for them to address not only COVID, but deaths of despair and also deaths of, uh, and also issues like you know, uh, people facing all sorts of complex pre-existing conditions, uh, like you know, ranging from leukemia and cystic fibrosis on down. Uh, it does seem to me that the tragedy of the people caught you know, in that Medicaid gap is, uh, is, is really striking. I would commend yep. folks to just look in the chat uh, at that. Uh, the, how, how should we deal with this sort of, I mean, there are a lot of Americans who do think that, uh, you know, they, people care about the distinction between the worthy and the unworthy poor. And, you know, here at, here at the Crown School, we sort of deconstruct that and problematize that and use lots of Jerry words to try to criticize and debunk that. But, that is a very deeply held view in the in American culture and American politics that you know you should that that getting free health care you know is one thing if you're developmentally disabled this is another thing if you're if you can't hold a job because you keep getting fired yeah uh, how do we how do we uh, how do we address that 
It's a real problem. Three words or I, less. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, obviously, I mean, that's an argument. You know, uh, Senator Sanders would have a pretty good answer to that, which is, well, you need to make it free for everybody and then finance it with taxes. And you don't have that problem. Um, right. I mean, that's the theory. Um, uh, otherwise, I think you're always going to run into that problem. Um, I, I, you absolutely run into it now uh, with Medicaid, with so many other programs. Um, so there's really, um, you know, it's, it's the nature of public policy. And, and it's this tension because the only way to avoid it is to create this universal system that gives everyone the same benefits. That's a lot more expensive. You're displacing a lot more insurance. If you, but then if you can't do those two things, you're going to target it. And once you get into targeting any kind of targeting, right, you're getting deserving and undeserving. It is striking. You know, it seems to me that, you know, a lot of liberals like myself sort of were tempted to make fun of people, you know, saying, keep, keep your government hands off of my Medicare and things like that. And what people are really saying there is Paul Starr and others noted at the time was, I deserve this. You know, I, I'm a retiree. Yeah. I've worked my entire life and don't mess with this and don't don't raid medicare for these undeserving people and we i think there was a sense that a lot of people on the left kind of thought that people in the tea party and some were being stupid or didn't understand that medicare was a government program when actually no people were perfectly sent perfectly intelligent they, they what they were really saying is that you know i just deserve this more than other people i've earned this and other people haven't earned it i couldn't say it better myself. That's exactly right. A um, couple other questions. What, what do you make of Max Baucus in this? Was he a hero, a villain, a bumbler? What is your take on him after, you know, researching? You know, he's such a central figure. Uh, yeah. What, what do you, what's your take on him? Uh, so everything's relative, right? <laughs> um, so I think your, your assessment of Max Bach is, is going to depend, A, on your, your, your philosophical perspective. I mean, you know, are you a liberal? Or are you, a, you know, more of a moderate? Are you a conservative? Um, obviously, if you're somebody who is, is wary of too, too much government, then, you know, you're pretty happy that Max Bach is, throughout the sort of process of the ACA debate was, was trying to keep the price down and was deferring more to private insurance. Um, obviously, if you're the kind of person, and I would put myself in that category, uh, who, who thinks we should have spent more money, more public program is better, then obviously, you know, you don't like that influence. Um, this sort of uh, bigger strategic uh, critique of Baucus is that he just, he chased after the Republicans for too long. He should have realized that Charles Grassley was never getting to yes. Um, he should have realized that Orrin Hatch was never getting to yes. Um, he should have realized that Olympia Snow was never getting to yes. Um, you know, I think there's something to that. Um, I would say in Max Baucus's defense, the following things. I would say number one, um, he believed sincerely that even getting one or two Republican votes on the final bill would make it more sustainable politically. And he really thought that. I mean, he was really shaped by the Medicare Part D experience, which was him helping, you know, him and a handful of other Democrats working with Republicans. I think he was right about that. I don't think it was possible to do, but if you could have gotten a handful of Republicans, I think that would have been more politically sustainable. Um, number two, again, having seen the memos, having seen the things that were said at the time, you know, something I just, I heard, I had not realized, but uh, Orrin Hatch, late 2008, actually sent his staff to Kennedy's and said, let's you and me do a deal, a bill together. Um, now, Kennedy didn't take him up on that, but you know, it was not, again, it was not so crazy. But um, the most important thing to know about Max Bach is whatever you think he did right or wrong, and this is, gets back to my point about how you judge it relatively. Um, remember 1993 and 1994 when Clinton's trying to do healthcare and Daniel Patrick Moynihan is the finance chairman and Daniel Patrick Moynihan does not want to do healthcare. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan is kind of pissed at the Clintons. And, 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 and that was like a huge problem for them. And having a finance chairman who did not want to do healthcare was very problematic. Now, compare that to Max Baucus, who was deeply invested in this. Now, he wanted to own it. I mean, he put out this white paper that was very much him sort of claiming the territory. But the fact is that a Max Baucus invested in getting to a universal or quasi-universal healthcare plan 
was hugely important to getting a final bill done, obviously because his committee has jurisdiction. But again, remember all the conservative Democrats you had in the Senate caucus. A lot of them, they didn't know healthcare that well either. And they were going to defer to Max on this. And his, okay. I mean, this is in part why Obama didn't push Baucus harder was they knew the whole time that it wasn't just Baucus. He carried a bunch of votes in his pocket. By the way, I'm, I'm having a memory of an earlier Davis lecture by Ezra Klein, uh, the young Ezra Klein, uh, talking about the Baucus white paper in 2008 and how it was an important thing. And somewhere in the Davis lecture archives, we can find a uh, probably 24 year old Ezra Klein making that argument. The, you know, one thing that was really striking about the Baucus thing is also how it changed the views um, among Democratic wonks. Like I'm, I can tell you that I, I may be the most conservative uh, faculty member at the Crown School, meaning that I'm a liberal Democrat. Uh, but yeah, I'm a sort of centrist liberal person. And one of the things that I and many others took from this was that we were never going to go and talk to a Democratic elected official again and say, go, what you really need to do is go work with the Republicans and find a bipartisan approach to this thing. That, um, that the experience of watching them run out the clock on Baucus radicalized many of us, not on policy, you know, a lot of us who are sort of moderates on policy, but we just thought, you know, the Republicans don't see it as in their strategic interest or something that they could sell to their own constituents to actually be negotiating partners with you on, if it's, if it's a big ticket item for you as a Democrat, they're just not going to be able to work with you. If it's something that is not on the front page and you have some policy agreements, then it's a different story. Then, then you can work together. Or if it's something like the opioid epidemic, there's some clear exceptions. But you know, I think when, when, like when the, when the $1.9 trillion package came down on COVID, a lot of us in this sort of wonkocracy were like, kind of took it for granted. It's a total waste of time to try to negotiate with Republicans. Just from a tactical point of view, even if we actually would be quite happy on policy to compromise, it's just not, it's, they're just going to waste your time and try to run out the clock on you. And it does seem to me that there was a real shift in mindset that, it partly explains why President Joe Biden is is not the Joe Biden who's telling uh, new President Obama to slow it down on health care. You know, it's just everybody's just like, you know, there's just realistically, there's no real Republican interest in negotiating here. Yeah, I mean, I think they learned the lessons. I mean, I think that's, you know, I think they I mean, the, the reason they are acting, the Demo Biden and the Democrats are acting the way they are now is because they lived through 2009 and everything that came after it. Right. The, the scorched earth, you know, opposition afterwards. Um, there's just no presumption of good faith anymore. You know, and, and why would you, um, you know, at, at, at this point, there's there's very little reason to, 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 to believe that. Um, you know, I always I, I say it's not like bipartisan is dead. It's now just bipartisanship is, you know, negotiation between the liberal and the conservative Democrats. Yeah, I don't even know if it's bad. It's just Republicans don't want to do that. You know, they just right. I don't even know if it's a, something you condemn. It's just a fact that 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 it's hard for them to do there. Um, Keith, is there a way we can call on people who have a hand raised? Do you know? Um, yeah, I can unmute. Do you yeah, want why don't you unmute, Michael, if okay. you could. Yeah, hold on. Michael, Masal, are you still able to, to comment? Okay, he should be unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. This is yes. Michael Masal. First of all, Jonathan, you did a great job. And there was so much that went through my head as you described the process of negotiating. I had as my mentor an individual by the name of Robert E. Cook, who was there to make sure all children had health insurance. And he was an advisor to the Kennedy family. And he was very committed that in the power politics of Washington, you could not create universal access for children with disabilities. He had two children with disabilities. He was a researcher and he had invented the sweat chloride test for cystic fibrosis. Previously, all those children died. Now they have wives and have precision medicine. And he pointed out to me that American health insurance was never designed to cover the following populations elders, veterans, children, women, 
people with disability, substance misuse. There's a whole long list. They were covering able-bodied working people, and that's no longer our demography. And second, their models are based on, if you and I cover 90% of the market, that is a wonderful thing. However, if 1% of people need dialysis, that breaks your bank on costs. Can you really comment on, do we really mean health insurance for everybody? Right now, we mean health insurance for the elder stop and nobody else matters because our ideology doesn't allow us to discuss who, what, where, and how, and what people need. Um, so, wow, there's a lot in that question. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, so I feel like there's a broad philosophical question of, of how we think about health insurance and, and health, you know, do, are we thinking, do, do we, do we think about one giant coverage scheme or something that covers specific groups? Um, you know, and when I look abroad, I see that even systems with universal coverage insofar as I understand them often have a separate supplemental kind of coverage for different groups. Um, and, you know, if I were to sort of, if we were to wipe away the map, and I was sort of redesigning American healthcare that, you know, I'd have some kind of basic health insurance for everybody. And then there would be some kind of add on for the people, for various groups that need something different. Um, you know, long-term care is often separate, right? It's a sort of supplemental um, coverage uh, for people with various uh, kinds of certain conditions. Um, you know, in the American context, honestly, I just, maybe I'm a sort of hopeless pragmatist but my general philosophy on this is you just sort of, you, you, you have to just sort of play whack-a-mole. Um, and, and, you know, we, it, it, at some point we get to the point where we can really kind of, there are occasions when you can kind of redraw the American healthcare system or parts of it, but mostly we're just sort of taking what we can, uh, uh, taking the pieces that exist, making them work better, bending them, adapting them to the people who need them, which is not an ideal way to craft policy. But in our system, I, it may be the only way to craft policy. Let me ask, uh, Tim Jost had a question in the chat. How much of an effect do you think fear of losing the Supreme Court ACA cases had on implementation? Oh, that's a good question. From Tim Jost, who knows more about this subject than anybody. Um, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. It's not something I actually now I want to go back and ask some people that because it's not something I really explored in depth. Um, you know, I, I sort of file it under there was obviously a general sense of a, 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 a defensive posture right throughout implementation, a sense that they were everything was under Klieg lights. Every mistake would be magnified. Um, you couldn't give any quarter to any critic. Um, and I think that hurt a lot of them. I think that was damaging to implementation. Um, I think we saw that in healthcare.gov. There was a fear of sort of admitting that things were behind schedule. There was a reluctance to sort of, there was a temptation also to ignore feedback um, because, you know, sometimes if it came from insurers, for example, the assumption was they were trying to game the system and they might've been trying to game the system by the way, but that didn't mean they were wrong. Um, so I think that fear the, the generalized fear of making the program look bad, um, twisted implementation made it very hard to implement because um, you couldn't talk openly about anything and just the normal feedback, you know, feedback loops broke down. And obviously I, I, I you know, I, I do think there was a political environment to the Supreme Court decision. You know, we'll never know. I, 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 there's exactly one person in the world who knows why John Roberts voted the way John Roberts did, and it's John Roberts. And I'm not even sure John Roberts knows. I mean, there's various, you know, there've been three very detailed accountings of the original, you know, NFIB case. Um, and Tim knows them better than I do, I'm sure. Um, you know, there was the accountant in Jeff Tubin's book 
there was the account in the biography of Roberts by Joan Biscubic. And then there was the accounts that came out right after the fact by Jan Crawford. And they're all pretty consistent with each other. If you really get into the weeds and you read them carefully, you'll know some slight differences, which I assume reflects their slightly different sources. You know, it's very clear, John Roberts thinking evolved, you know, how much it evolved, whether he really changed his vote, I think is an open question. I mean, it was very clear to me that from day one, he was leaving himself. He, he asked a question in oral arguments, very clearly signaling he was already thinking about the taxing argument that, you know, he ultimately, ju you know, justified, you know, used to sort of uphold the law. Um, so, you know, I mean, I know people who think that the sort of all the political machinations about it did affect him. I know people who think it didn't. Um, but, you know, I do think people were conscious of the political atmosphere. Um, and I think in general, like not wanting to, not wanting to admit problems with the ACA was a political imperative that sometimes complicated implementation. Let's just say so that, and that, yeah, oh, go ahead. I just, I wrote a column where I used quantum field theory to explain that Supreme Court decision. I think <laughs> I, I proved that, uh, that this Scalia particle was a briar moving backwards in time. Uh, the, uh, but, um, um, you know, one thing, just to close out, what was the one most, you spent all these years researching, you interviewed President Obama and so many other people. What was, what was the biggest surprise to you or the biggest way that your own thinking changed in the process of researching and writing this book? So I would say uh, the biggest surprise for me, which Mary wouldn't surprise most other people, was, you know, since I'm a policy reporter, right? I'm a policy and politics reporter. I'm very much in the sort of everything can be explained by big theories and big changes. You know, you can understand the Affordable Care Act by understanding the giant political currents and the sort of policy arguments of healthcare policy and such. And individuals don't matter that much at the end of the day that this is primarily a story of large forces, not individual people. And I realized in my reporting that's wrong. Um, I, I, I became convinced that all individuals mattered. We talked a few minutes ago about Obama, how important he was. I think if you replace Obama with a different democratic president, I think there's a very good chance there's no Affordable Care Act. Um, I would say the same thing for Nancy Pelosi um, and Harry Reid. Um, they are, both of them, I thought, um, understanding the work they did just as, 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 as managers of their caucuses, um, that is a skill. That is hard to do. Uh, look at some of the people who have done it, tried to do it since then, especially on the Republican side. Uh, th they are very good at, you know, Reed and Pelosi both. Um, people like Henry Waxman, uh, who, you know, uh, just uh, spent so many years figuring out how to pass things in, under difficult political circumstances. Um, and then you kind of go down a layer, right, to like staff and, and, and officials. Um, and it's not that, you know, any of these people, you know, it's, it's not that everybody always made the right decision. Lots of people made wrong decisions. But those individuals mattered. Ted Kennedy mattered. Um, the sort of staff at, you know, the staff at Ways and Means or Senate Finance mattered. The White House officials mattered. Um, and again, to me, I think the instructive, the, the proof is if you just line up 2010 and 2017 side by side, you know, I, I mean, just let's look at the Senate leaders. I think that's the best example. Harry Reid and, and Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell had a reputation as a genius. Still does to some extent. He's a strategic genius, Mitch McConnell. And, and people didn't really say that about Harry Reid so much. But you know what? It's very, you know, Mitch McConnell's really good at blocking things. And he's really good at getting people on the Supreme Court. You know what he's not really good at? Passing a law. Turns out that's a very different skill set. Um, managing a caucus to actually pass a major piece of legislation that's complex. And tax policy is never, you know, this, at least nowadays, the tax policy they do isn't that complex. Um, uh, he's not good at. Harry Reid's really good at that. Um, and uh, I think individuals matter. They matter at the highest levels, they matter at the lowest level, the level of the activists who showed up at the, you know, both the Tea Party activists in 2009 and then the ones who showed up at Republican town halls in 2017. That, those 2017 town halls were every bit, if not more important to the outcome of that debate as the 2009 Tea Party out, uh, protests were. I mean, that outpouring really drove media attention. 
And I think really, I think for Republicans who had lived in a media bubble where Fox News, you only watched Fox News, you had no idea there was anyone out there who liked the Affordable Care Act. You really did. I mean, they, they never said, I mean, whereas if you watch like MSNBC, you knew there were a lot of people who were unhappy with it, but also a lot of people who were happy with it. And, you know, I think those protests made a big difference. So people make a difference. Individuals make a difference. That's a very heartening place to end is that agency matters. What we do matters and social structure matters, but it doesn't, and political structures matter, but they don't, oh, they're not always decisive. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for a great talk. And, uh, uh, I highly recommend your book for those of you that uh, that, that haven't purchased it. And uh, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, uh, for being with us today. And uh, um, so uh, uh, just thanks very much. Thank you. It was so much fun. Thank you, everybody.